And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator for tonight's program, Carol Spaulding Cruzy. Carol is Associate Professor of English at Drake University, where she teaches fiction writing and American multicultural literature. In addition to her teaching, Carol also writes fiction, poetry, and short articles under the name Carol Rowe Spaulding. Her work has appeared in several journals and anthologies, including Glimmer Train, Nimrod International, Mississippi Review, and Pushcart Annual 16. She received the Pushcart Prize for Fiction and has won several other national awards. Carol recently completed a novel about the writer Gertrude Stein titled 27 Rue de Fleurieu, and her new book with co-author Kay Fenton Smith and due out in December is entitled Zachary's Bridge, Children's Journeys from Around the World to Iowa with an introduction by former Iowa Governor Robert Ray. So now please join me in welcoming Carol Spaulding Cruzy. Good evening, readers. And thank you very much, Sally, for the introduction. When I was asked to facilitate tonight's panel on To Kill a Mockingbird, I decided to reread the book by choosing it as my family's after dinner reading time selection. I figured my 12 going on 13 year old was ready for it, and my husband admired the 1962 film. According to my family, you could see Scout or Atticus or Dill or Aunt Alexandra in my facial expressions as I read. We could hardly wait for each evening's chapter. When it was over, we felt like we were losing the company of an old friend. Most of you are here tonight because you know that kind of book love, and many of you feel it in a fierce and abiding way for Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. Then again, maybe some of you are here because your presence was required by teachers or parents. <laughs> or because you admire one or more of the distinguished individuals sitting to my left. Or maybe you just want to know what all the fuss is about. Tonight, in a manner of speaking, is about the fuss. Fifty years. Most books published this year won't last 50 weeks in terms of their influence. It remains to be seen how well even Harry Potter will fare in half a century's time. So, we are here to celebrate an important book, but I find it not a little ironic that this celebration is taking place at what many see as the end of print culture, as we know it. Between Facebook and Kindle and Twitter and Google and Nook, we know that people are reading and writing. But as I revisited Harper Lee's novel this summer and reveled in the almost chewy sentences laden with texture and punctuated with nuance, I realized that we are poised not just at the end of the book as we know it, but the end of the sentence as we know it. And I do confess that's a loss I mourn. Consider this line. Simon would have regarded with impotent fury the disturbance between the North and the South as it left his descendants stripped of everything but their land. Yet the tradition of living on the land remained unbroken until well into the 20th century when my father, Atticus Finch, went to Montgomery to read law and his younger brother went to Boston to study medicine. Their sister, Alexandra, was the Finch who remained at the landing. She married a taciturn man who spent most of his time lying in a hammock by the river, wondering if his trot lines were full. Now, go crack open a copy of the original Tom Sawyer, or Peter Pan, or Moby Dick, all stories deemed suitable for youth of a certain era. Try reading it to a 12-year-old today. Most will find it incomprehensible, impenetrable, the story's the same as in the abridged or easy reader version, 
but the sentences make English seem almost like a different language, the way that Middle English now sounds to speakers of modern English. Some people now have that response to To Kill a Mockingbird. They say, read on, it does get better. I say it's delicious from the very first sentence. I teach writing, and I know that intellectual development at the college level is dependent upon one's grasp of sentence forms. Sometimes a student gets stuck for a while because she lacks the syntax to think a, com a complex thought. Sentences are complex because being human is complex. A story is how it is told. But. I heard on the radio that Iowa's own poet laureate, Mary Swander, loves to Twitter, and that poets are finding renewed inspiration and audience from engaging literacy and technology. So I have no doubt that fine and complex vision and ingenuity will continue. But let's witness the passing of sentences like Harper Lee's or J.M. Barry's or Mark Twain's, just as the West witnessed the end of the oral tradition and the 16th century witnessed the changes wrought by the invention of the printing press. Not, that is, without consternation. Of course, To Kill a Mockingbird offers endless material for discussion and debate, not the least of which is the subject of race. That the novel still speaks as urgently to the issue of race in 21st century America as it did so long ago should give all of us pause. Why don't we get better at solving this problem? Like we've gotten better at dentistry or the minimum wage why don't we look back and say, oh yes, the novel was set back in the day when race still divided us. Instead, race divided us in the 30s when the novel is set, in the 60s when it was written, and in 2010 when we gathered to celebrate it. Race is such a compelling subject in the novel that it's easy to forget it is about so much more. It's about childhood, siblings, poverty, the rural South, Southern womanhood, friendship, the sacrifice of parents, disability, civility, sexual abuse, single parenthood, class division, dignity, and the strength of character. My list is not exhaustive. And the novel's richness is there for those who want to talk about aspects other than the topical, style, tone, structure, nuance. Many of you have your own topics you'd like to discuss tonight. Our panelists will cover some of the topics I have touched on. But before I turn to introducing each of them, let me pause just a moment to thank you for being a reader of a novel like To Kill a Mockingbird, whether you do so by page, screen, or sound wave. Long live the complex sentence. We are so fortunate to have with us five interesting, accomplished guests from right here in Des Moines. In the interest of time, I'll introduce each of them and then ask you to welcome them with your applause. And I'm also told that your microphones do need to be turned on and that you need to share them. So, <laughs> To my immediate left is James Austry, Autry. Excuse me. From businessman and coach to consultant and speaker, Jim Autry has had a significant influence on leadership thinking. He is the author and poet of 10 published books, the most recent of which is Looking Around for God. His book, Love and Profit, The Art of Caring Leadership, won the prestigious Johnson Smith and Chrysler Award as the book that had the most impact on executive thinking in 1992. He received considerable national attention when he was one of the poets featured on Bill Moyer's special series, The Power of the Word, on PBS, and Garrison Keillor's The Writer's Corner on NPR. Autry lives in Des Moines with his wife, Sally Peterson, retired lieutenant governor of Iowa. And next we have J. Barry Griswell, the former executive chairman and former CEO of the Principal Financial Group. J. Barry Griswell is an experienced business leader with a distinctive approach to being a more successful leader. He is well known for his hands-on approach to management, strong support for his employees, and deep involvement in the community. Mr. Griswell is the co-author of The Adversity Paradox, An Unconventional Guide to Achieving Uncommon Success, which offers not only inspiration, but also steps to increase your business savvy at any stage in your career. He offers both motivation and practical guidance on how to turn difficulties into assets. 
And next we have Judge Odell McGee. Polk County District Judge Odell McGee is well known in the community and throughout the state as a jurist interested in human rights, First Amendment protections, and children's rights. He was the first African American to be elected president of the statewide Iowa Judges Association. Judge McGee was elected to the National Board of the National Bar Association and was president of the Iowa National Bar Association for more than 10 years. He was elected group chair of the National Prosecutor Association, was active in committee work, and has served on several special committees of the Iowa State Bar Association and on the executive board of the Polk County Bar Association. And next we have Kitty Weston Knauer. Kitty Weston Knauer is owner and executive director of KWK Enterprise Incorporated, an educational consulting firm specializing in, in the development of student-centered educational programs, providing guidance in the development of holistic professional development programs, assisting with the development of policies and procedures that support educational programs, and facilitating the development and implementation of charter schools. She has been the recipient of many awards and honors, and she has a strong background in school leadership, working with challenging student populations, and bringing together parents and community members to support students and schools. Ms. Weston Knauer is also an adjunct professor at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, where she supervises student teachers. And last but surely not least is Sarah Brown Wessling. Sarah Brown Wessling, a 10th through 12th grade English teacher at Johnston High School, was chosen the National Teacher of the Year from among the 56 2010 State Teachers of the Year. She is passionate about education in the 21st century and incorporates everything from singing to Facebook to grant proposals in her classroom. Mrs. Wessling has been recognized by President Barack Obama as the nation's top teacher, and students have reported that learning in her classroom is never boring. Please help me welcome our panel. The format that I'd like to follow tonight is to have um, each of our panelists, I've asked them to prepare a few minutes, um, five minutes talk or so, um, based on their reactions to the book. And then um, what I very much want to do is open it up to your questions and to have them talk with both one another and with you. So we'll have some discussion in a little while, but first we'll hear from each of our panelists for a few minutes. And uh, Jim Autry has asked that he be able to stand. So for this first one, I'm going to switch places with him, and then the rest of them are going to sit. So just so you know what's going on there. So we'll start with Jim. Thanks. Thank you and welcome everyone. Our family had only one Civil War story. It is told that my great-great-grandfather Jacob Autry rode with General Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was reputed to be a superb military strategist whose techniques were studied by Nazi Field Marshal er Erwin Rommel. That connection has always intrigued me because Forrest also founded the Ku Klux Klan as Nazi an organization as there ever was in this country. In our family, we learned from childhood that great-great-grandfather Jacob was shot off his horse during a skirmish near the Tennessee-Mississippi state line. A Yankee musket ball creased his forehead horizontally, making a bloody but superficial wound. He was knocked unconscious, however, and left for dead. When he woke, his horse was gone, so he made what I consider one of the more rational and intelligent decisions ever made by an autry. He just walked on home and quit the war altogether. <laughs> <clears throat> the only evidence I have that this story is true is a photograph of a family setting in which great-great-grandfather Jacob has what appears to be a black horizontal streak across his forehead. In one way or another, every Southerner story is tied to that war and to race. I recall being selected to go to the Midwest National High School Band Clinic when I was a senior in 1950. 
My wife said, you have to say the, the, the date. And I said, I don't really want to say the date when I was a saint. <clears throat> I had to ride a Greyhound bus from Memphis to Chicago. And it seemed to me right out in the middle of nowhere, the driver stopped the bus, turned around and said, all right. And I asked, what was this about? And someone said, the Mason-Dixon line. Then the African-American people on the bus stood up and moved from the back of the bus to sit where they wanted to. I was astonished. A young black man sat by me. How you doing, he asked. I said, fine, how you doing? He said, fine, and we both went to sleep and slept all the way to Chicago. <laughs> I recall that incident so vividly because it was another of the consciousness-raising experiences of my young life. When I finished rereading To Kill a Mockingbird recently, I was struck by a sub-theme that I'd not seen lo those years ago when I first read it. Back then, I focused, as I'm sure everyone did, on the black-white relationships and the injustices done, not just in the courtroom, but in everyday life. Back then, I focused also on the stereotypical characterization of the small southern town with its plantation owner class, its overseer class, its slave class, and the conflict and competition between, quote, poor white trash, unquote, and African Americans. The point, of course, being that the only sense of self-worth the, quote, trash, unquote, could derive would be from their perceived or imagined or hoped for superiority to the blacks. This has been a staple of much Southern literature. A strong undercurrent in that characterization, of course, is the varieties of prejudice and discrimination inherent in that social structure. In the late 60s, my youngest son was stricken with epilepsy. He later outgrew it in college, and I became involved as an advocate for people with epilepsy and for people with other disabilities as well. 27 years ago, my son Ronald was born. He has autism. Thus, my advocacy for, right, for disability rights continues. Clearly, this has made me sensitive to issues of disability. As we would have said in the South, I've now come a long way around the barn to get to the point. And that is the sub-theme I recognized in the book. In my recent reading, it struck me that the author has made disability a parallel theme with race. Consider Atticus was disabled, blind in one eye. Arthur Radley, of course, had a mental disability, either retardation or autism. Tom Robinson was physically dis disabled, what was described as a withered, withered arm. Miss DeBose was disabled by her morphine addiction, recognized incidentally in today's society as a disability. One of the most remarkable pieces in this book comes at the end when Scout, quote, stands in the shoes, unquote, of Arthur Radley, a disabled person, and sees the world through his eyes. That's where I shed a tear because that's often how I try to see the world. This rereading made me remember my childhood in the South where there were people in the community known as Gimp, or Popeye, or Dummy, or Nub. As I said earlier, this is really about the varieties of discrimination. There were spoken examples in the book. Scout's attitude toward the quote lesser unquote whites the poor white trash, the community attitude toward African Americans. But there were also other discrimination only implied and often laughed at. And yes, we, the reader, were also pulled into that. The sad thing is that here in 2010, these prejudices still exist. Not as bad as they were, but they're still with us. But. As a slave sojourner truth is quoted as saying, we ain't what we want to be, we ain't what we're going to be, but thank God Almighty, we ain't what we was. Thank you. And very Griswell. 
I knew I would be in over my head, over my league, and Jim just proved that I am. Uh, this, this is going to be difficult. Um, uh, quite eloquent, and I wished I could do that. But, but um, like, um, uh, like Jim, I, uh, I was uh, raised in the South, and, and that's really the first lens that uh, I come to when I think about what this book has meant to me. Uh, I was born in 1949 in Atlanta, and uh, of course the book was, uh, was written in 1960, so I was 11 years old. And I would say to you that it's, uh, it's hard to imagine what went on between the blacks and the whites and the race in the South without having been there. It's hard to explain it and have people to really understand what you're talking about. One of the books that I read in preparation for this was a book on the 50th anniversary called Scout, Atticus, and Boo. And I think it was in, in that that I read a quote by Reverend Thomas Butts, who was the uh, minister of a church near Maycomb uh, in the book, uh, where Harper Lee uh, worshipped sometime after she wrote the book. And he said, it was a time in which black people were treated terribly and people took in racism with their mother's milk. It's, it's hard to explain to you how you get born into a culture and born into an environment where you know no better for so long, where everything around you reinforces something that is horribly wrong where people being forced to sit on the back of the bus, separate water coolers. Um, and, and it's just, again, hard to explain what it's like. And I think we all need a Atticus in our lives. And the Atticus in my life was my mother and Michelle's parents, who did have a heart for justice and a heart for loving people regardless of their race. And you have to have somebody who's willing to show you that way. And hopefully they show you that way earlier in your life so you can get on with being the kind of human being uh, that you were meant to be. Um, but there are other lenses. Um, as, of, as, as I have grown older and as I think about another lens and the, the other lens that I want to mention is that lens of civility. Uh, I'm on a little bit of a kick right now, uh, as some of you may know, to promote civility within our community. There are a number of things going on where we're trying to just raise awareness. And as I read and learned and studied the book this time around, I was struck by the impact of civility and the lack of civility. I was struck by, you know, the crowds and the yelling and the violence, not just toward the races, but as Jim mentioned, toward Boo, toward there was prejudice that just cut across the rich, the poor, the educated, the uneducated. And this lack of understanding and lack of communicating and lack of being honest and straightforward with each other was really heart-wrenching. But then I kind of think about it today, as Jim has reflected, have we really made a lot of progress in this area? Maybe between the races, maybe. But it's taking on new forms of prejudice and new forms of bitterness. And I really worry about that. I worry that we don't really take the time to understand each other's point of view, that we don't respect people as individuals before we judge who and what they are. Michelle and I have been doing a lot of work on native land, and what went on with in the South between the blacks and the white goes on in native land today. I tell you, Native Americans are among some of the most um, abused and, and uh, disadvantaged that you would find anywhere. And unlike the African Americans who we made slaves, and then we ultimately freed them. The Native Americans are really stuck on their land because all we gave them was their land. And, and they can't get out of their situation because they're landlocked. And I've been doing a lot of work there. I'll just close with, um, with one last comment. Um, when I was, uh, and, and I, Jim and I exchanged some thoughts on this when he was writing one of his books, but uh, I was a regional sales manager for an organization that happened to cover Alabama and Mississippi. And I went into every small town in Alabama and every small town in Mississippi. And I took over an organization that was made up of 15 or 20 managers. And they were all men. Uh, there were no women in their organizations. And there were precious few people of color. And I found myself as a young 28-year-old trying to manage a group of older men, most of whom were racist. Now, I don't mean racist in the worst of sense, but they all were men who had grown up in this culture and who had never shed this culture. And I found myself at odds continually trying to understand how to be productive and help these folks be productive. And yet, um, 
um, you know, stand up for what I know is right. And that brings me to my final comment. I read something recently that a friend sent me that really questioned, and maybe this is something that will be provocative, whether or not Atticus was really uh, as great a human being as we think. Because you see, Atticus was somewhat docile. He walked out of that church when he, or out of the courtroom when he uh, was, when, when uh, Robinson was found guilty, and he stood, all the African Americans stood, and he walked through. But you know, he never did anything with that. He never became an activist. He never became the kind of person that tried to change the larger system. I'm not judging. I think he's a great human being. And in fact, I'm, I'm going to close that when I, I spoke at the Sandra Day O'Connor uh, 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 program recently, I, I quoted from uh, Charles Lamb, who is in, actually in the book in the foreword, and it says, lawyers, I suppose, were children once. So uh, I, I think uh, Atticus is my favorite lawyer. Uh, I, I'm really struggling with whether he did enough. So thank you. Thank you very much, Barry, and Judge McGee. Good evening. Um, I'm Odell McGee, and uh, in 1952, I was born in Liberty, Mississippi. I'm sure most of you want to know where Liberty is, but Liberty is the first town that you uh, would get to outside Macomb if you're coming up on 55 from New Orleans. Uh, it was a, a very... Uh, interesting community. I lived there until I was 13 and my parents uh, uh, left there in the uh, uh, great plights of the uh, 60s and moved to Chicago. But I want to talk to you about uh, the first 13 years of my life in Liberty, Mississippi and to tell you uh, about uh, what it was like uh, to be in a society where there were in truth parallel societies. There was a black society and uh, a white society. You know in truth um, my family was the type of family, uh, the Robertson Hughes and the McGees, um, they were considered to be, in terms of black family, um, the Robertson Hughes family, I'll tell you very quickly, and this is the great joke, uh, my mother's family is very light. Uh, many of them could pass, and pass didn't mean they could pass for white. On my father's side, they were very dark. And, well, I took after my dad, as you can see. <laughs> But anyway, uh, to have that conflict, which on my mama's side, I was old black something all through my life. I do a poem called Old Black Henry, and it, it goes this way. And I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to get back to my story. But it will tell you about uh, my life at that time, even in black society. And it tells her, when Henry was a little baby, uh, folks used to tell his mama, they'd say, uh, they'd say, uh, uh, my, 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 they'd say. You, you, you know, your, your baby is black. <laughs> but, but she kept her head up high like, like she knew something. When Henry went to school, it was always get back too big, too dumb, too black. But, but Henry still kept his head up high like he knew something. When Henry was a teenager, he, he saw the girl. Uh, uh, how about a date? He said, uh uh. He'd say, too big, too ugly, too black, as they walked away. But, but still, Henry, he, he kept his head up high, like he knew something. And then along came some folks who taught black folk how to love themselves. Now you see Henry walking down the street, shoulders strong back. Everybody else look at Henry and say, my, 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 my. Ain't that one beautiful black young man? <laughs> you know what old Henry does? He keeps, up, keeps his head up high like he knew something that, that they should have known. Black is beautiful. And uh, that, that's my life uh, coming from Mississippi, raised in that situation. My grandparents and my parents sheltered us until we were old enough to really understand what was going on. I really, you know, I don't have any real bad uh, thoughts of, uh, of uh, people who are non-minority. Uh, Gary and Bobby and Tommy and I used to swim in the river, naked, in the river. Uh, that was Gary and Bobby and Tommy was white, and myself and Bo and, and, and Teddy, we were all 
black, and we swam there in that river every day until fifth, until we, or until we started school, or until we was five years or six years old. And then all of a sudden, they didn't want to play with us anymore. And we didn't understand because they lived right next door. You could see them, but I, you know, it just started to, you know, just, and Grandma told, well, you know, they have other things to do. And we just accepted the fact that they had other things to do, but we kept right on swimming and didn't pay any attention to it. And when there were incidents in the community, for example, when the KKK burned up my cousin's home, or ran my auntie out of Mississippi, uh, they swept it on the road while well, she moved away. Or they would say, well, uh, you know, that it was an unfortunate fire. They didn't want to expose that to us uh, in the young years. And so we, we really didn't know that we were discriminated against most of the time. We know that they had a bigger house, and I knew my mother worked for Mr. Rovilla and Mr. Common. I knew that, because Mr. Rovilla would let me sit on the floor in front of her and watch Queen for a day. Now, I dare not sit on the sofa. I had to sit on the floor. And that was fine, because I was still watching Queen for a day. I didn't care where I sat, <laughs> or whatever else she let me watch. And I, you know, I grew up knowing that there were differences, and knowing that they were over there, and those were white folk, and you're black, and this is where you belong. We played baseball, we had picnics, we had fun. And really, in truth, I think sometime, I never thought about the fact that I was being discriminated against. I just wanted to go to grandma's and eat her food because she was the best cook in town. And my other grandma, I wanted to go to her because she had the best flower garden, and I loved flowers, and I loved to sit with grandma, and she'd tell me about something. And tell me. That was what was important to me. The parallel societies, we accepted the fact that it was different. They lived over there, and we lived here, although there was, no, you couldn't tell the difference. I was, I'm always fascinated with how people can tell the difference between where white folk live and where black folk live. But the salesmen would come to town, they would not go to the White House, they would know where the black folk live. How in the world do they know where the black folk live? Or the people who want to sell things to white people, they come, they would not stop at the black folk house. That's not how. And even poor white people, seemingly they didn't know the difference too. They wouldn't stop at their house either. And I didn't understand that because we lived in the same type of house. The shotguns, shotgun houses, you know, you shoot, the, shoot through the house with the shotgun and you don't miss anything because it's a shotgun. The houses, the rooms all run back. But anyway, that's how we lived. But uh, it was a, a great time for me. Uh, even with all of the issues going on. I do remember, though, in the 60s, when they wouldn't let us march downtown Liberty, Mississippi, when they said they didn't want the black folk to have the yearly homecoming march through downtown. I remember the, the uh, fountains. And I remember uh, going to the movies and having to sit on the balcony. Now, my mother was strict about that. She said I couldn't go. She wasn't going to let me sit on the balcony. And she wouldn't let me eat ice cream at the local facility where, because we couldn't go to the front. She said, no, you're just not going to do that. No, you're not going there. And he just said, no, you're not going to do it. And I accept the fact that, well, it wasn't. Because you know, my mother said, we're not going around to the back to buy no ice cream. My money's just as good as anybody else. So I remember that. And, and we accepted it and went on and just lived our lives and didn't worry about it. And that's how you know, we lived together. It was a given. This is your place, I'm sorry. And this is their place, and you don't belong over there, or you belong over here. We accept it, and we learn to enjoy our families and to enjoy what we had, as opposed to what other folks had. And um, a very famous black woman, Arthur, says, you know, people will read my story, she said, and they would think about how sad it was that I grew up in a situation like this. But she said, you know what? We were really quite happy. I had a lot of fun. And that's what I said. You know, it was bad, but we were really quite happy and had a lot of fun. Thank you very much. My name is Kitty Westenauer. In 1966, I came to Des Moines, Iowa from Orangeburg, South Carolina. I was born in 1948 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. We then moved to Durham, North Carolina, where my father began his college career at North Carolina Central in Durham. As a matter of fact, my father went from no degree to a PhD, and my mother 
to masters. There were six of us kids at the time, ended up being a total of eight, but six of us kids at the time. My parents were very much involved in the movement in North Carolina. And actually for them, it began actually before I was ever born. But I do remember the 50s and the 60s. Even living in Durham, I understood what racism was all about. We were Catholics. And you just didn't find black folks who were Catholic, okay? <laughs> I, I'm telling you. And a female on top of that? Oh, honey. Couldn't be an altar boy. We couldn't go to the Catholic school because too many kids in our family were too dark. And I understand exactly what you're saying, Odell. However, the sister who's a year and a half younger than I am has blonde hair in the summer. We come in many shades, many hues. One of the things that we learned very early on from our parents were that there's no reason not to achieve. Education was our out. I remember telling my dad when I got in high school that I wanted to go to Durham High, and he did. He tried his darndest, even had an attorney. They wouldn't allow it. Their reason, we lived on Fayetteville Road. Durham High was on the other side of town, and that would be too far of a bus ride for a delicate young lady to take across town. Now, these folks didn't know what determination I had, and folks who know me understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> I was, um, let's see, I had five brothers, okay? And I'll tell you right now, there was nothing that my brothers did that I couldn't do better, okay? <laughs> and you have to understand why that was the case. Um, even though they were allowed to have a paper route, that was not something that I was permitted to do. Their paper route, though, was only within our neighborhood. Now, living in Durham, we had very segregated um, areas that, that we lived in. And so in my community, I knew the doctors, the lawyers, the preachers, the teachers, the cab driver, the guy who owned the dry cleaner, uh, the guy who owned the grocery store. But I never could try on the clothes at Belk and I couldn't put the shoes on my feet. You see, my parents would trace around my feet on a piece of brown butcher paper and take it in the store and slide it in the shoe and you would just hope that you got the correct size. I tell you, I've had four foot surgeries in the last 10 years simply because over the years I did not have the correct size shoes. Couldn't try the clothes on. And I will never forget the very first time that there was a, a, a store, a clothing store, that allowed us to try clothes on because my dad took my younger sister and I shopping. Brand new clothes we were able to buy there in Durham. When my father completed his PhD, we moved to Orangeburg, South Carolina. I was a junior in high school, and I told my dad, you know, they didn't let me go to Durham High. I want to go to Orangeburg High. And my father worked diligently to get me in. The reason, very plain and simple, I had been in advanced classes, and I will tell you this. I received a superb education from superb African-American teachers. My books were 10 years old, I know, because you looked at the names in the books. And I would be number 11, 12, or 13. But it wasn't education from the books that I received, but rather the education from my teachers. 
In Orangeburg, my father was told she can't go. And so my junior year, I repeated three of the same classes that I'd had my sophomore year in Durham. But my father said to me, Kitty, that's going to change. And he hired an attorney. My senior year, I did a turn 10 Orangeburg High. Now, let me tell you what those slick folks did. And my dad said, you can be upset about it or you can take it on as a challenge. Plain and simple, you will not receive an A in any class unless you work twice as hard as the top student in this school. Yeah, okay, no big deal. I don't have a problem with that. I spent the first 14 years of my life climbing that ladder anyway, and I'd gotten pretty darn good at it. And I took that challenge head on. I continue with that challenge to this day. Now, of course, they didn't allow me to graduate in the top 10% of my class. I graduated number 13. People will think that's an unlucky number. It's not. And the kicker was, when I said that I was not going to school in the South, they looked at me like, this Negro has got to be crazy. Where in the world does she think she's going? You see, I had applied to only five schools. They were all in the Midwest. Unbeknownst to them, my parents had had us all around these United States, we had traveled. And in 1962, I had had an opportunity to come to Des Moines, Iowa. And I had an opportunity to be on Drake's campus, as well as many other campuses throughout this country. And I decided I was getting the heck up out of the South. There was nothing to keep me there. There were too many parallels in To Kill a Mockingbird that I had experienced. And I'd be darned if people were going to continue to do that to me. Now, let me tell you what's interesting about what I found in coming to Des Moines. And I tell you, when I came to Des Moines in 1966, it was a culture shock. It was a culture shock because for the first time, people accepted me for who I was. I will tell you this, though. Racism does exist in Iowa. It's much more subtle. And my daddy told me, plain and simple, you need to be very careful who your friends are. But I will say that there were many, many people who worked diligently to help me become the person that I am today. What I see in Des Moines should not be existing. There are many great things, but there are too many youth who are not excelling. And that's why I have made it my life's work to assure that every young adult I come into contact with understands that there are expectations and that there's nothing in this world that they cannot do and cannot achieve. Even in retirement, I continue to do that. I think it's important that we understand the significance of the 50th anniversary of To Kill a Mockingbird. It's important in that we need to make sure that we continue to help every person understand the dignity and their self-worth. Because everyone, and I do mean everyone, regardless of race, class, color, creed, whether or not they are rich, poor, call it what you like, are deserving of that human dignity. Thank you. Thanks. Well, first of all, I want to know who in here has read the book? And who in here has taught the book? All right, some kindred spirits. Um, 
One of the things that really um, has struck me listening to the rest of the panelists is they have these amazing stories. I'm from Iowa. I was born in Iowa. I went to college in Iowa. I'm here in Iowa now. Um, but one of, one of my privileges as a teacher is really the opportunity to help my students see the stories in other people. And when I listen to these stories and I see these students over here, I think about the amazing opportunity that we have to connect something like To Kill a Mockingbird to stories like we're hearing tonight and understand how they reflect each other, understand how they open each other up, and, and really allow us to um, enjoy this text. Um, so I have this incredible relationship with this book. Um, and in fact, this very book I have an incredible relationship with, and I have a little confession to make. <laughs> it is the only thing I have ever stolen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Judge. <laughs> Um, so the first time I read To Kill a Mockingbird, I was a junior in high school. And when I read it for the very first time, I remember, uh, I was a voracious reader, uh, and it wasn't unlike me just to kind of get lost in a corner of the house and just read it well into the night and, and such. But I remember reading this at the kitchen table, and I remember getting to the end of part one. And I remember crying um, out loud so that the rest of my family could hear, because usually this is something I chose to do um, in private. And for me, the first time I read the book, the most powerful moment was when Jem, at the end of part one, um, realizes uh, what Mrs. DeBeau has done and the kind of courage that she's offered. And because I am an English teacher and I'm not in my classroom, I'm going to be totally indulgent and read one of my favorite lines. I wanted, this is Atticus talking to Jem as he's trying to understand what Mrs. DeBeau um, has done by giving him this flower. I wanted you to see something about her. I wanted you to see what real courage is, instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand. It's when you know you're licked before you begin, but you begin anyway, and you see it through no matter what. You rarely win, but sometimes you do. Miss DeBeau won all 98 pounds of her. According to her views, she died beholden to nothing and nobody. She was the bravest person I ever knew. Jem picked up the candy box and threw it in the fire. He picked up the camilla, and when I went off to bed, I saw him fingering the wide petals. Atticus was reading the paper. The first time I read this book, I thought this book was about Jem. <laughs> um, and there was something about his understanding, that, that moment of enlightenment that I connected to. And so it was quite a few years later before I read the book again, read this very book again. Um, and it was before the first time I taught the book. And I have to tell you, there's this amazing experience that we can have with readers of the book, but there is an entirely different experience that we can have as teachers of a book. And when I reread it the second time, I realized I had it all wrong the first time. Um, and this is a book about Scout. This is a book about some authentic, genuine child with the wisdom that we all wish that we would have. And it's her voice that captures me, that captures my students time and time again. It is when she says, hey, boo, two words. That's, that's what resonates for us. That's what resonates for my students. And I think that that's really um, what keeps us coming back to, to the beauty of the book. Um, with that said, one of my most beloved colleagues, uh, well, before, talking about Twitter and such, mm -hmm. um, before I came, I um, put up a digital uh, wall, like sticky note wall, and I invited a lot of my Twitter friends, Facebook friends, English teacher friends, to post their favorite moments, questions, um, just reminiscence about um, To Kill a Mockingbird. And my dear colleague, Ed, said, um, my favorite quote about that book is from the movie Capote, Truman Capote who of course is Dill in the book. I don't see what all the excitement's about. 
So certainly there are people who see, uh, see the book differently than I do. And I think there's something really important for us to know, because I also read um, Scout, Atticus, and Boo uh, before tonight. And there certainly are lots of moments in the book that um, are not perfect. And, and there aren't strong characters for every reader to connect to in this text. Um, but this is what I think about a text like this. It's like Huckleberry Finn. It's like Little Women. They're amazing texts, but they have these moments where they just, the, we want more. This is what teachers need. They need these books with imperfect moments because that's where we teach. We teach in the imperfect moments. We teach in the gaps and in the nooks and the crannies. And so when, when my students come in contact with this book and they say, not me, when they say, I don't know if we've come much further than this book. I know that its power is not in, in the ideal of it, but just in the honesty of it, in the authenticity of it. Um, so with that, um, I will turn it back over to you because I'm so anxious to hear um, what everyone out to hear thinks. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, so much for, can you hear? Jan wants me to move the podium back. Um, for those very interesting comments from everyone. And I know that some of you, since it looked like 99.9% .9 of everyone in here has read the book, which is wonderful. So I know some of you want to talk about your favorite moments and ask some questions of the panelists. So um, just uh, very briefly, um, Jim Autry talked about um, the the theme of disability running through um, the, the themes of discrimination and prejudice, that there is not just racial prejudice in the book. And he talked about how disability was represented. Barry talked about um, the notion of civility and how it's now needed more than ever. Um, Odell McGee talked about growing up in segregated um, Liberty, it was it Mississippi, you said, um, in the South. and. Um, and living um, the very segregation that's described in the book, um, as did Kitty Knauer um, from South Carolina. And then um, thinking about um, how the book is taught and how the book is read and how the book is loved by readers. Um, thank you very much for your comments, Sarah, as well. What would you like to ask any of our panelists? What would be um, some questions that you want to raise with any of those subjects, and if the panelists have any questions that they would like to ask of one another, please feel welcome to do that, too. Uh, this is for you or the other teachers in the group. One of the things that stopped me 50 years ago and stopped me again as I was reading this is while this is a very engaging and, and textured story, it's always a challenge for an author to write in a, in a voice, a first-person voice, mm -hmm. of someone like nine years old. And I found instances throughout this book where I thought that the diction, uh, the narrative style, uh, was simply beyond what any nine-year-old, even a very preco precocious one, would, uh, would, would do, would say, would write. And I was wondering what you English teachers uh, think about that. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's something that students pick up on right away. Um, but I think that we read it as a, as a recollection, as a, as a recollection of an adult looking back on this nine-year-old voice. And so I think what we, what we um, can reconcile. I think she starts out saying, I think she starts out saying in the past tense, when he was nearly 13, my brother Jim got his arm badly broken at the elbow. And then when enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the events leading to his accident. Take it all back. Okay. <laughs> It, 
of the year, you know. Yeah. It's a good thing there wasn't a quiz, Jim. <laughs> okay, I feel horribly. You're, you're Jim Ockley. <laughs> oh, God. How about others of you out in the audience in terms of um, Scout as the narrator? A little girl. But all the, most of the great books, Mark Twain's great books, Horatio Alger, I mean, you have most of the really, really great books are told through the eyes of children, and they're not children writing them. So it seems to me that's just a natural outcome you're going to have when an adult is trying to look back and create a voice. I mean, they're going to have to go beyond a nine-year-old. I mean, I, I think it's an interesting, but I think what I've captured is the, is the power of reading a book through the eyes of a child. I think that brings more power than you could ever get by doing it any other way. The, 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 the other thing you need to note is, is that she is able to tell the story in no way an adult would be able to tell that story. Because it's obvious you all have been captivated by the story. And, and I find that to be even true. Because when I tell stories, I'm telling them from my past even though it is an adult voice at this point in time, I'm still telling it from the past of the child that I was. I also think that we believe Scout as a nine-year-old, and if it were an adult saying those same words, I don't know if we would believe that adult voice. Uh, it's too pure. What other, what other questions do you want to ask about the book? Or do you have a continuing comment on, on the scout as narrator? I'm kind of... It's on. Uh, I'm kind of interested. Uh, I read an uh, essay uh, about a week ago that I'd saved from Malcolm uh, Gladwell from The New Yorker, a uh, wonderful piece in which he talks part of the time about this book. And he talks about the difference between civil rights and humanitarianism. And I think that's a big difference in that book because that's where Atticus, to me, is coming from. Um, that he's just teaching, it's not just about racism, it's about what Jim referred to. It's about all those prejudices we have against all different people. I, I referenced that article when I was talking. It's in the, it's in the New Yorker by Malcolm Gladwell. And it, it, and it is Malcolm Gladwell that the, it's been raised by other people. But he was the one who raised the notion of, is Atticus really a hero? Is he really, uh, you know, and, and we all have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, did we do enough? Those of us who grew up in the South have to ask ourselves, did we do enough? You know, or are we just passive? Or did we do something that was good, but we didn't go far enough? And that was the first time I'd heard any doubt cast on Atticus's, uh, whether or not he was the, the true um, uh, I don't know, activist that he should have been in those times. And I don't know. I, 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 he did a heck of a lot more than I probably would have ever done. So from that notion, I, my hat's off to him. You know, one of the things you need to realize is that Atticus was one person. Um, stop and take a look. Uh, the, was it the sheriff who came to him and, and said that he would be defending uh, this gentleman? Um, the question would become, why did... And, and it wasn't just the sheriff, I'm sure, who made that decision, but why did the people in the community make that decision? It would be Atticus who would uh, defend uh, Mr. Robinson. The other side of the coin is this. You have to remember, that was the South back in the 30s. And it was it, it just totally different in terms of who would be a hero and who wouldn't. The fact that he even stepped to the plate, because he could have easily said no, and then who would it have been? But the fact that he stepped to the plate. Now, granted, the trial ended as it ended. How many thousands of trials have ended in that same manner? And the victim, in this case, Mr. Robinson, winds up 
um, not necessarily dead, but in a sense they, they end up dying. And what more could Atticus have done? Trust me, the African American community at that time appreciated the fact that he even stepped to the plate. And, and they also appreciate, even though they knew that Mr. Robinson was not going to be found innocent, they appreciated the fact that Atticus really put himself in that position. And that wasn't the first time he was put in that position because he was put in that position also when those poor white folk came to get Mr. Robinson out to begin with before the trial even took place. So I have to give uh, Atticus a lot of credit for, for putting himself out there. They direct that to Dr. Gladwell, not me. Oh, okay, <laughs> right. Well, I was going to say in terms of uh, the parallels that uh, one might draw between uh, a multitude of maladies, a multitude of depressed people or suppressed people, however you want to put it. I think it's only typical that, you know, when one think about, for example, uh, slavery and they think about uh, the King and I, for example, where uh, uh, Moses uh, in, in Japan and, and you know, whatever, they, they use slavery and the plight of black folk, like Tom Cabot was. That uh, uh, they use in that play uh, to highlight uh, the plight of women in Japan. And what I'm saying is that when you look at people who have had difficult times, you can always draw a parallel uh, between their plight and what they went through and, and all kinds of things. And so it's only natural that all of those themes that uh, Mr. Archer talked about was, is a typical of any people who have been suppressed. I mean, those types of things happen to all of them. And uh, if you can get a hero, or look at a hero from the, from the slave era, you can draw parallels to the difficulties that we have now from an economic scale. I, I hold true to a philosophy that had those people all had a million dollars down in Mississippi, had the black folk, I mean, you know, it would have been different. But they didn't have any money, and so, I mean, you know, truthfully, they were on the bottom and everybody suppressed them. And, and we can draw that parallel through most of your four parents who came to this country and the things they had to go through. So I think it's very typical to see a multitude of themes in any type of great writing and all of the people being basically the same, going through the same kinds of things. Was there a question down here? Yes, well, comment maybe. Uh, I think it's rather interesting in the book that the focus is kept on Mr. Robinson and on Atticus by not discussing the flags behind the judge, the United States flag and the flag of Dixie. By not doing that, they kept the focus on the personalities who were involved mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not side issues. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You need to understand that that flag of Dixie is still there. Yes, I know. That's why I left. I just want to say for someone who was born two years after Odell, Atticus was my hero, and I was raised here in southwest Iowa. We had one black family where I grew up. We didn't know any different. You know, they were fine. We were fine, okay? But Atticus was my hero because he was just like my father. They instilled in me the values that I had. I took those. Had I been a little older, I would have been in the South with the Civil Rights Movement. But I took those values, and I stood up for what was right all the way through school. Odell knows I went on to become a deputy sheriff when women did not do those things 35 years ago. So I read the book similar to the size you have. I read it as a child. I reread it. I, I read it till it fell apart. Okay? Now the parallel is I also read in cold blood more than once. Go figure. <laughs> but Atticus to me was a hero. Mm -hmm. I noticed that there are a lot of uh, young people in the room who might be students of teachers who have asked them to come tonight. And I would love to give, um, make a special invitation to any of the young people who are guests tonight um, to ask a question if they so choose. After Lorenzo. <laughs>
Sarah, had you been going to have a comment on that too? Did you want to? No, I was just going to say it seemed to me, uh, from the perspective of the young lady, it was perfect because I mean she was not tainted. Uh, since she was not tainted, it was the perfect opportunity for her to uh, present to you in a positive way because she wasn't, you know, she wasn't tainted with all of the stuff going on around her. She just wanted to be good and wanted to be involved with great things. And I think that utilizing that type of perspective, she can tell, a, 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 I think, a, a much better story. I mean, had it been told from uh, the, um, or the interest point had been that of someone who had gone through it all, perhaps they would be overburdened with all of the, um, the different perspectives and, and have accepted quite a few of themselves. But from her, she was still just an open vessel. And what better way to tell stories than someone who just wanted everything to be perfect and good and was perfect and good. Go ahead, Sarah. And then, were there any students who wanted to ask a question? Okay. <laughs> I think I see a hand back there. Yeah. <laughs> picked up the book last year. I did it for Battle of Books, and it was a different book to read. It, it had words that were kind of hard to understand, uh, but I really did like it, and one part that I really liked was uh, the, the tree, there's that knot, and, and then they found the mm. gifts in there. Mm -hmm. That was uh, a part that I really liked, and I was wondering what were some of your favorite parts in the book. I had a couple of favorite parts, but one of mine, of course, and, and I continue to, to read it over again. One of the things in growing up in our family is we learn the different registers of the English language, okay? And we were taught that in our home and at school and among adults, we were only to speak the king's English. Now, in the book, there was, and I think that's in chapter 12 where uh, uh, Jim and uh, Atticus go to church, um, with, uh, with Claire. And one of the things that, uh, not Atticus, but Jim and- Okay, and Jim and Scout go to Scout. church at Calpurnia? Yeah, okay. that's it. And one of the things that Scout comments on is about the fact that, why do you talk like that? What, what's that all about, you know, so to speak? Um, and one of the things that, that as an educator, I, I always talk to my students about were the various registers of English. So when you're with your friends, you speak one way. And when you're with adults, you speak another way. And you know when you're with important people, how you are to talk. So I, I still find that to be um, um, very interesting because it, it's, it's still a, 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 a piece of learning for, for youth. 
I have so many favorite moments in the book. I love when Walter Cunningham puts all the syrup on all of his food. I love when uh, I, I love when the kids call their dad Atticus. Uh, I love when Atticus and Scout sit down after Scout gets chastised in first grade for reading. She's already reading. She's not supposed to know how to read yet. And she learns what compromise is. And she says to her dad that she doesn't, um, that reading is like breathing to her. Um, it, I, yeah, English teacher. Um, I love, I, I, and then there are, are kind of all those funny moments um, at different points in the, in the book. I love when, um, when Jem gets his pants caught on the fence. Um, but I also, um, I also um, am moved by um, Mayella Ewell and, and the moment when she realizes the totality of what's going on in this courtroom. Um, I love when Atticus takes off his jacket in the courtroom. I love, I could just keep going. Um, I do. The point is, though, um, and I think this kind of um, harkens back to what you mentioned about entry points. The point of, of offering lots of examples is that um, as teachers, I think we have this special role or kind of this fulcrum in the reason why so many of you raised your hands. It's kind of like an heirloom that we pass down. And so many of us love to teach this book because we love to read this book. There was something about it that spoke to us. And so there is the 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 placement of this book in our educational system, I think is really important in the reason why we're even having this 50th year celebration. And part of that is because there isn't just one entry point. I think that there is very clearly um, one way of entering into this conversation about race that this book can offer, but this book offers entry points into all of those themes that you mentioned, into this idea of disability, into the notion of empathy and tolerance and courage, and what it reminds me about and what I hope my students take away from this experience is knowing that a book is not one-dimensional. And, and there should be many dimensions and many lenses through which we come to understand it. And over time and over many reads, those change for us. And we have this um, gratifying experience over and over again because it's never quite the same. The, uh, this book that we mentioned, uh, Scout, Atticus, and Boo, uh, one of the things it does is it has other great authors comment on what the book meant to them. And they talk about their favorite parts of the book. And they each tend to identify with a character. And this gets back to the entry point to some extent. And it seems there is a, a, a sense that a lot of women uh, seem to, to you know, re uh, relate to Scout. A lot of men tend to relate to Jim. And almost all of us have some uh, affinity for Boo uh, in, in some ways. And I think it was Harper Lee when asked who she really, even though she was writing through the voice of Scout, actually brought up Boo mm -hmm. as someone that she related to. Uh, in terms of her personality. The thing that I found kind of at least entertaining was Dill. I always like when Dill came into the conversation, the very beginning when he pops up and starts making these bigger than life uh, statements about his name and how long he's been reading and, and then to, to, to start reading that and know that that was uh, Truman Capote and then start to read some of the things in the that came about later about what role did Truman Capote play, the fact that Harper Lee actually went to Kansas and helped him research uh, the, 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 the book that he wrote. So I find that whole deal thing uh, to be quite intriguing. Good. Other questions that you have over here? One of the things I find fascinating about the book is uh, how motivated Atticus is uh, to be able to look his children in the eye. And uh, a long time ago, I was sitting in a church uh, in a confirmation class, and people were sharing why they were part of the church. Almost everybody said because of children. And uh, I think a lot of good things in the world wouldn't happen except for the fact that there are children. And uh, to me, with that in mind, the, 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 the most courageous work that Atticus does is not in the courtroom but with his children. And he patiently, uh, 
he risks he risks exposing them to things that he's not sure if they're ready for but he knows this is the world they're going to live in and they got to know it and and at the same time he paints a vision of how it doesn't have to be like what you're seeing and you know his, his deep faith that if you just walk in another person's shoes most po most folks are actually pretty likable if you can just stand in their shoes and uh, before I came here today I watched Oprah and she had an anniversary show uh, going back to 1987 where she revisited a show uh, and I don't remember names some of you might remember this better than I do but a gay man uh, jumped in a swimming pool in, in the south someplace and he had AIDS and that got out in the community and it caused a big uproar some of you maybe remember it I really don't but it, but Oprah had a show about it and today her show was bringing back those same people and uh, the the one man who was very outspoken very very critical was there and uh, you know he kind of apologized not entirely but uh, you could see growth you could see growth in really every person who was there. And uh, I, I think that's one of the most difficult things there is in life, is to accept a slice of bread at a time, you know, rather than demanding the whole loaf. And sometimes you gotta demand the whole loaf too, but, and I think Atticus is a model about that. And I think in some ways, uh, he did plenty. I don't know what more he could have done, you know, uh, the, the impatient part in us wants people to stand up and be superheroes, but we really can't be that, you know, so that's my comment. Oh, one last thing. I'm a teacher in the Des Moines Public Schools, and it's the most uh, culturally integrated place that I've ever been a part of, and I've been doing it now for eight years, and it's been a very healing and positive experience for me to be a part of the Des Moines Public Schools and to have that, uh, that experience. Uh, again, it's the most uh, culturally diverse uh, organization I've ever been a part of. Thanks. Barry, had you had a comment from earlier? Okay, All right. Um, we are at, at about 10 till eight, and I wonder if um, there were other questions that people had or other topics that you feel like we should, you'd like to bring up about the book. Yes, sir. I was going to comment on that. I, I go to Mississippi every year, and uh, I'm still fascinated as I drive uh, from New Orleans or down from Jackson, down to my hometown, how it's basically the same. Um, it, it's amazing to me that we live in a world where the world has moved on, but living in Mississippi is about the same. The stores might have one African-American worker. Um, my auntie works for the sheriff's department, the only black who's ever worked there, and they ever out front. And, uh, and my cousin is a police officer. Uh, he can arrest white people, but, you know, in the old days he could. But, um, I mean, that, but not very much. The people are all the same. Uh, they live in the same houses. And my mother was a maid, and, you know, she's no longer there, but, you know, that... Miss Rovilla and Mr. Kama, and, um, they, they still have their maid, and she's a black woman, and she cooks and takes care. But th there's no real change in those areas. Now, I know other parts of the world you can see great changes, but uh, Liberty, Mississippi, about the same. Oh, you know, they, uh, they took the whites out of the school system and put them in academies. And I, it was interesting, last uh, year, my cousin, who is uh, my distant cousin is a good basketball player. Well, the white school wanted to <laughs> allow him to go to their school because he was a good basketball player. So I, I think that's, that's a change. <laughs> but uh, all the blacks go to the public schools and the whites go to the academy. We just, we just changed it a little bit. You know, they, the public school, when they integrated, the whites all left. And, but it's about the same. All the people are the same. Jim? I want to hitchhike on that. Uh, as a matter of fact, if, if you go down there now, you'll find African-American 
kids attending the academies that started out as white academies. So it's, 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 it's really amazing the change. I graduated from the University of Mississippi in 1955, six years before, seven years before James Meredith came down and integrated it. In fact, I used to go back in the 60s and, and uh, I, I enjoyed saying, you know, I'm with Meredith. <laughs> but uh, but uh, what's the, when I go down there, I'm on a committee at the university and I still go down and lecture sometimes. I am astonished at the change. When I was there, it was completely white. Uh, I was editor of the paper and we, you know, we were the liberals and we were talking all this, and constant fights, fist fights, and stuff, hard stuff about integration. And now the president of the student body has been black. Miss Ole Miss, which is the big popularity beauty contest, is black, the cheerleaders the editor of the paper. I mean, it is the most integrated campus, and but the uh, uh, African-American is only about 12% of it. And it's, uh, but I've just been astonished. And you, the whole business about, you know, uh, boys and girls dating one of the blacks and whites dating, that's just all gone. It's just all gone. Now, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't live down there on a bed. <laughs> But it's not because of the racial issues, it's other issues which don't bear going to in, into in this conference. Uh, but um, Odell, I've been just amazed at the changes I've seen down there. No, I, you, 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 it, it depends on the perspective, okay? Um, Durham, North Carolina has become very cosmopolitan because it's now Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill, okay? Um, you have uh, African Americans who are doing wonderful and marvelous things. But you know, that's not what I look at. I'm looking underneath the surface. That racism still exists. I don't care what you say. My mother has begged me, Kitty, come home. Uh, sorry, Mom, it ain't happening. Um, and, and the reason, very plain and simple, is that I am still an African American female. I'm a danger, though. I am an educated African-American female who speaks her mind. And as long as I don't upset the teapot, everything's cool. Now, I'm speaking from experience, from my side. Go into the small towns. You know, Odell, you're right. Uh, I remember reading the book, The Spook, Sit by the Door, and that's what you will have. And that is not who I am, nor will I ever be. And that's why I say, even here in Des Moines, Iowa, we need to make sure that those vestiges of racism, sexism, classism, whatever the ism is, is eliminated. First of all, we need to understand that there's no such thing as race. Because quiet is kept, we all came from the very same spot on this earth. And only when man moved about the world did the pigmentation change. When you bleed, it is but one color. It's red. I'll just say, I agree with Jim to a great extent. The University of Mississippi, I have a cousin that goes to school there. And I would agree that a lot of the institutions that you've seen where there are you know, blatant racism now, they've let a few in. And, and, and he said 12% of the population, I would agree. But as Kitty said, if you go to Liberty, Mississippi, you, you don't see the change. You no, know, Jackson has changed because it's mostly black city. And, and a lot of other communities are the same. Even in, in Liberty still now, I mean, the KKK won't come and kill you because we have lots of intermixing. But, it, you know, they, they're shunned if you marry a black guy. You're not accepted. Uh, in my little hometown, Liberty, Mississippi, uh, we have one cousin that has a white wife there. And I tell you, you know, there's nobody in town will speak to her other than black folk. I mean, she, they will not talk to her. But I, he's correct. I mean, and I said, you will see the institutions that are integrated. Now, you can, you can go into the stores and try on clothes. 
I mean, you can do that. I mean, you can do uh, all the basic things, as, as Kitty said, as long as, you know, it's not too much of a push and you understand that you still have a place. But yes, the institutions have modified and they've moved forward and, and there's not quite as much racism as I knew. But really, in truth, uh, down the toe is about the same, Jim. I'm sorry. <laughs> I really believe that. Well, I think if you go to a big city like Atlanta, it's enormously different. I mean, that's where I grew up, and I, and I, and it, I mean, it's entirely different in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia is a very um, mixed, uh, I mean, the people get along, and people are, uh, you know, and I have such great uh, regard for Michelle, my wife's father. Uh, in the South, one of the things that happened is the first black that moved into your neighborhood, the first thing you did is put your house up for sale. And you get the heck out of Dodge because you know they were coming and the value of your house is going down. I mean, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm telling you that's the way it was. I'm not, not <laughs> yeah, well, that's, maybe the North too, I don't know. But uh, Michelle moved to Atlanta when she was uh, about 11 or 12 and moved into a neighborhood that was all white. And so shortly after she lived there, the, the first black moved in and then the second black. And the next thing you know, the whole neighborhood was African-American except for one white family. And that was Michelle's family. They stayed there the entire time. And increasingly, that happens today. You don't see the flight that you used to see. So I think Atlanta is different. But I will also say this, and this hurts me to say this. If you get around friends and you get around neighbors and you get around people who will be honest with you and you just listen to the language and you just listen to every once in a while, something will slip out that just lets you know that deep down, it's not a whole lot different. I was just going to share um, a moment that I had with my students that suggested some change in interpretation of the text or, or experience with the characters. Um, we were early on in the book and we had encountered Boo and they had just discovered that it was really Boo who was putting all of these little um, toys and trinkets in the tree. And uh, and I was talking and I was all excited and they just kept looking at each other and they weren't contributing to class and I said, what is wrong? And they said, well, you seem to kind of like Boo. And I said, well, I do. Do you don't like Boo? And they said, no, he's a creeper. <laughs> and I said, what's a creeper? <laughs> and they said, you know, this is a stranger giving kids gum and things. Don't you think that's a creeper? Um, and so there are, um, you know, certainly moments where experiences of our students have changed how they interpret and make sense of characters. Um, and in that way, I think it was unfortunate, the change. But on the other hand, when my students look at um, the Ewell family and they look at Mayella and they look at her father, um, they, have, they, they have no tolerance for what he did. Um, and I think that is an important shift. Um, so there are, are, there are shifts um, that are funny um, and important as well. I think a lot of the discussion we've been having here at the end about how things have changed or haven't changed or you know, how students relate to this book just really demonstrate the awesome power of literature when it's real. If Atticus had won the case and Tom Robinson had been acquitted, we wouldn't be talking about To Kill a Mockingbird 50 years after it was written because it wouldn't have been real. In the setting, in the time, what Atticus accomplished, the questions left unanswered, the struggles that we still have to face. This book is still being talked about today because it brings home the struggles that we all face. It brings home the justice issues that we wrestle with, whether it's black and white or Hispanic and white in a school or uh, just whatever it is that divides us. And there are still so many things that divide us that the way this book was written and what the characters accomplished and what they left undone is what gives it power and lasting power and why we're still talking about it today. Yes, a question here. and the uh, present panel discussion tonight. And I'd like to thank each of you because I know enough about Des Moines um, history to know that each of you have done remarkable things in your own area. But I have to say, as I look around tonight, this to me looks like an excellent example of what you just mentioned. 
I rarely go to any sort of uh, function of this type where there are black faces, brown faces, red faces. I think as a community, we need to do more to make welcome uh, those who might not be uh, white middle class people. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. And there's a comment right behind you. Good evening. My mother told me as a teenager in the late 60s that there were good people and bad people in every race. And this was during the turbulent 60s, which helped to balance my mentality. Which brings me to my question. How many more Atticus Finch can we find, do you think, in 2010? And if racism is standing in the way of America's progress for humanity, how do we best change the paradigm for equal justice under the law? Public education that provides a competitive education regardless of your social, economic, or political status. I watched a program about Jews coming to America last night on IPTV, and many of the problems that Jews face, American, uh, African and African Americans face, and I'd just like to, to know from anyone on the panel, what suggestions do you have in Americans facing the issue that racism is a problem. If Barack Obama went out on 42nd and Broadway right now, I would bet you he cannot catch a cab. So I'm just looking for suggestions. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I truly believe that our problem in America as well as the rest of the world in terms of uh, uh, the problems that we have. I, I just really believe it's an economic issue. I think uh, we're not um, most poor folk being uh, subjected to uh, what I call, you know, I, I wrote a poem called uh, Always the Same. And, and the poem talks about um, in the whole world, uh, the people on the bottom are always the dark people and the dark people are always the poor people. and in most societies, they are the ones who are discriminated against. I mean, I lived in Norway, and I remember when this was way when I was in college and high school, I was an exchange student. My mother thought it would be good to send me to Europe, and, and but anyway, I did do that. But anyway, but I was interested in living in Norway. And I said, you know, Norwegians and, and, and Danish, they don't discriminate, but but they did. And who they discriminate? They get the Turks who came through, and, and all the other. Dark, that's when I. This is not the United States. How could you? And my brother, who was true lover of black Americans, hated the Turks. And I said, well, how, could you, how could you hate the Turks and, and, and love black folk? You know, you know, I didn't understand that. But what I'm trying to say with that is that if people had money, I mean, if every black person was given a million dollars, I, I think we forget about the race problem. <laughs> and, and the same thing with everyone else. If we could get rid of poverty and have everybody on an equal standard, bearing educational and social, we wouldn't have so much racism. But you can't, you can't do that. And as a byproduct, we have these problems. But I really, in my heart, believe that it's an economic one. And I don't know how you can bring a whole bunch of people up unless they're willing to bring themselves up. Uh, and, and, that, and I think that's about it. Because as long as you have the undertow, if people don't have money, you're going to have discrimination. You're going to have people think they're better than you. You're going to have all this stuff that, that we see every day. It's basically all boils down to no money. Yeah, go ahead. They're about to cut it. 
to cut us off, so I want to just make a plea. Tomorrow night at, uh, at Drake University at 7 o'clock, we have a great speaker, Bill Bishop, who's written a book called The Big Sort. It helps you understand why we are sorting ourselves the way we are, why we're creating a lack of civility, and uh, this audience looks like one that would benefit greatly from hearing Bill Bishop. We had Chairman Leach in uh, a month or so ago. We have a gentleman by the name of P.M. Forney coming in in February who's written a book, Choosing Civility. I personally think civility is at the, at the heart of a lot of what we're talking about because it means you have to have respect for the individual uh, regardless of anything else because they are a human being made by God. And if it started there, I think we would have solved a lot of our problems. So please come 7 o'clock tomorrow at Drake University. Uh, Shazalo Auditorium. Well, a special thank you to each of our parents.